decision, um, time that we made the decision, it I, I would say it really wasn't easy um, to, to cancel the impersonal convention. But amazingly enough, uh, we pulled the plug and then it seemed like a lot of other organizations followed right after. So uh, clearly we made made the right decision, I think, in hindsight, um, as hard as it is to not be with all of you in person. Um, yeah, I'm sure many of you have, have spent more years in, in all of the fair associations than I have, but uh, it's something I definitely look forward to every year is just getting together, um, telling stories and um, all of that stuff. So again, uh, don't forget uh, tomorrow we have our annual meeting at uh, 12 p.m. Central Time. And um, make sure you have not uh, got your membership up to date. That needs to happen um, before you can vote. So um, we do have some bylaw additions, um, some some district and uh, associate board elections, and um, we want everyone that can to participate. So make sure that you have all of your memberships up to date. If you know of somebody that does not have their membership today, please let them know. Um, so again, kind of an interesting start to our convention as far as not being in person, but I think um, as an organization, we're going to try to to do these types of things. We are going to have monthly educational sessions starting with this one tonight. Um, so look forward, uh, look for more emails and notifications to come out from Tara on what those are. Um, I didn't put the dates in front of me, but first and foremost, we're going to going to attack um, tonight. We do have um, some showcase show, showcases for this evening, and um, I think that's how we are going to get this meeting kicked off. Um, I'm going to call on my good friend Tim Stevens from GLberg Entertainment to announce our um, first showcase act for all of you um, tonight. So Tim, take it away. Thanks, Corey, and uh, hello everyone. Uh, hope everyone is staying safe, staying healthy, and continues to do so as we uh, hopefully get to the other side of this uh, whole mess uh, real soon. So appreciate the opportunity to uh, have the showcase this evening. Uh, the gentleman's name is Kenny Ahern. You know, I've never really liked the term Kids Act, as I have always felt that a performer at a fair should entertain the kids, the parents, the grandparents, and everyone in between. That's why I like to call Kenny a true family entertainer. Experience? You bet. A former Ringling Brothers circus clown, followed by over 30 years of performing his solo comedy show, To Laugh is to Live. Across the country and across the world at state fairs, county and regional fairs and festivals and more. What does Kenny do, you might ask? He juggles. He balances a 12-foot ladder on his chin. He plays the saxophone while balanced on top of a rolling globe. And more. Plus, he includes audience members in on the fun, and they actually become the stars of the show. And he's able to do all of this keeping the safety and health of fairgoers a top priority. Get ready to smile, folks. Here is Kenny Ahern. Okay. 
Kenny Ahern, and I'm a family entertainer. Sorry about that. Kenny Ahern, and I'm a family entertainer. I love performing. What's it mean to be a family entertainer? It means that when I perform, grandpa to grandchildren and every age in between are all laughing and having a good time at my show. It's something that's very, very important to me. It comes out in every show that I do. It's all about the audience. It's about making them happy. It's about them having a good time. It's totally about them happier than when they are not. I love being able to travel with my own stage. Just no matter where I go, I end up having really the perfect setting. All anyone has to do is give me space, power, and I'll do everything else. The nice thing about my stage, it's very flexible. I can perform indoors. I can perform outdoors. I can even set up under a tent. There's a lot of possibilities to create a great atmosphere for audiences. <laughs> the funny thing is, is that I don't talk during my show, but I have a state-of-the-art sound system. Well, it's twofold because music is really important to my performance, and it's also a great opportunity for other acts when they perform on my stage to plug into a quality sound system. There's a performer in everyone, and I strive to find them. I want to believe feeling like a star. I'm in my own stage, my sound, my lighting, my show. Once I'm set up, you don't have to worry about me at all. And a nice guy. I'm a nice guy. I promise I'm a nice guy. I am all about making your life easier. I'm Kenny Ahern. And I'm a family entertainer. I love performing. Awesome. awesome. Tim, you want to give a little close up then? Uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to uh, be the first showcase in our new virtual world. Uh, appreciate that very much uh, to the showcase committee and, uh, and the board for selecting Kenny and our agency to be able to do this. Uh, as And that's Kenny right there. I mean, uh, obviously three minutes worth of what he can do, uh, but it's all about the family. It's all about the audience. So it's all about having fun. It's all good, clean fun. And uh, a big part of, uh, as he developed, uh, even though he unfortunately did not get to perform this summer, than one day at the Minnesota State Fair uh, food event. Uh, he was ready and raring to go with a uh, basically a COVID safety protocol uh, show, uh, putting in a lot of uh, different safety protocols to fit the, the, the needs of the fair goer and, and uh, the fair uh, staff as well with uh, hand washing stations, announcements, et cetera, to make sure. So Obviously, we hope when we get into the summer of 2021, we may not need, you know, to have as many safety protocols, but uh, Kenny, along with our acts, will be ready to go with that if need be. And so thanks again, everybody. Appreciate it. 
All right. Thanks so much, Tim. Again, um, if anyone is um, interested in booking Kenny at Hearns, they can get a hold of Tim Stevens at GL Berg and uh, find out if uh, if he'll work with for you. Uh, it was fun to see some fair footage. So that, that was a good kickoff. So awesome. Um, but the big part of tonight is obviously we had a have a keynote speaker. We um, are, are very honored to have this individual um, speak to all of you. Um, Michael Bradley is the owner operator of M MHB Productions, which provides consulting services to fairs, festivals, and events in North America and Asia. He has more than 40 years of executive level experience within the fairs and exposition sector, having served as CEO at fairs in California and Arizona, as well as executive level positions with the California Farm Bureau Federation. He resides in Paso Robles, California, and directs the fair management training program at Cal, Cal Poly State University in San Luis. I'm not trying to, uh, uh, Upsido, California. So all of you enjoy Michael Bradley. Um, I wanna say thank you to the IFE for providing the opportunity to have Michael Bradley speak um, to all of you and um, enjoy his presentation. And then at the end, there will be an opportunity for some question and answers. So Michael Bradley, take it over. Well, thank you, President Heiser. And, and for, uh, it is a pleasure to be with you this evening, um, even at great distance of approximately 1500 miles. But uh, we're all used to that by now. And um, congratulations on pulling off um, the beginnings of your, your conference here. And uh, it sounds like it's going to be very, very productive. So it is an honor. And, and um, I'm really uh, looking forward to making this presentation, although it's a little bit awkward. We, we generally do in front of everybody, right? So um, we're going to go ahead and get try to get started. There is some Q&A at the end. Um, Tara is going to walk me through this if I mess up on the technology side. Um, but uh, we're going to share this and then go right to a PowerPoint program. And by the way, um, the pronunciation of that beautiful city is San Luis Obispo. So. Thanks for your help, Michael. No problem at all. <laughs> so let's see. This, uh, can we see anything on the screen there, Tara? Not yet. OK, we're, we'll get there here. Kara, should I go to the um, the pink, the whiteboard, or did we need to go somewhere else? Okay, I thought you went to the PowerPoint. Yeah, so that's right. That should bring it up there. Can we see that at all? No, nope, not yet. Okay, we're gonna, we'll get there eventually. Okay, we're gonna go up to share at the top of the screen, right? Yep. And then pull up the PowerPoint. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, here we go.
we're getting there. It's um, it's thinking about it. Isn't technology beautiful? See, this is when we should have spent some money on a good MC, and then you would have <laughs> some time filler. You know, this is this is always my favorite part of the in-person convention is now we could hear some funny jokes and that's right. That's someone right. dance on their head, and instead now we just get to to stare at um, at, at a blank at, screen. Yeah, you're all right. Well, this worked uh, when Tara and I were going through it earlier in the week. We've all become technology experts in the past uh, <laughs> six or seven months. I can assure you of that. Okay, let's try. Okay, the computer's telling me 10 things here. It's going, so fear not. Eventually this will happen. Well, we've got you blocked off for an hour, so if we spend 55 minutes of it watching <laughs> you painfully try to get your screen to be exposed, I mean, we'll have some sort of entertainment out of it. I mean, that's right. That's if we right. had some other talented associates on online, we could probably show some juggling. No, I'm just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> So speaking of technology, how many of our fairs are, are going to Zoom fair meetings? How are you handling your your meetings now that, that we can't meet in person or some of you meeting in person? Just just to, to kill some time here, I'll, I'll set up and listen. Can I butt in here? We, uh, Don from Norman County in Minnesota, we had our annual meeting scheduled for uh, Tuesday of this last week and um, we, we were going to meet in person in the Civic Center in town, and uh, we talked about it, and, and my a couple people couldn't make it, and, and we decided to Zoom it, and we did Zoom our meeting, and uh, the secretary the next day said it was one of the best meetings we'd ever had because she could hear and take notes because people weren't uh, hammering down beers and weren't talking through the whole thing, so <laughs> she thought it went very well, and I thought it, I thought it, went, it went well, too. And it just so happens with our 16 members, uh, three of them either have been or were COVID positive, just in little old Ada, Minnesota. So um, it worked out well. And I talked to some people the next day that said, had we not Zoomed it, they, they probably wouldn't have participated. They wouldn't have come. It, it wow. worked well. I said, I have a Zoom, just a private individual Zoom account. And, uh, you know, you're limited to 40 minutes. But now Zoom has sort of opened that up a little bit, too. So we basically went the full hour, I think, of just... Uh, talking fair stuff. So it went well. And, and we've we been doing it worked that, that well with some of the guys that we make fun of have their flip phones, but but they adapted and a couple guys, you know, got together in one guy's shop, uh, another guy's wife set him up on a uh, on her smartphone. And uh, yeah, it, it worked very well. We, we've done Zoom meetings on and off since March. And uh, we even held a joint meeting with the uh, county commission earlier this week, all on Zoom. We actually purchased a membership, uh, a Zoom uh, account, because um, last week we tried to have a meeting and we uh, they cut us off. So we had another one and we got cut off again. 
Yeah, we do. A, I'm on also in the Minnesota Federation of County Fairs, and we have a, a Zoom account that uh, is good for unlimited minutes, and you can get up to 100, hey, Tara. Uh, 100 people on there. I, I don't know what to pay Tara. for it, but that's what we do. Tara? Yeah, your screen is not shared. Yeah, and I keep trying to share it, but I'm getting a pop up here that's indicating um, there's a problem. Anyone you want to connect? Enter, enter your name. Yeah, but that's not going to. I've heard on a professional level, back to the conversation about Zoom meetings, that many big corporations are going to be changing the way that uh, their normal meetings have been attended. Even I know one of my uncles has spent usually like four days a week in airplanes and travel with meetings. And since this all hit, he's had no travel. And he thinks that even when this is um, finished, they'll be going to more of a Zoom, um, Zoom style meeting so he doesn't have to travel as much. And they've saved enormous amounts of money not um, spending time in airplanes. Well, I think what we found here in Walsh County is that we we yeah. our our attendance actually picks up at his, at our last Zoom meeting. We had yeah. a really good attendance simply because people were home and they didn't have to drive, and, and it, there is some convenience to it. And the way we get over the um, the numbers gap is that, well, of course I'm with NDSU Extension. We have a we have a big account, so we can we can put a lot of people into our meetings, and we don't get stuck on the time. So it, it has worked well from that aspect. The Mary, go ahead. Extension in us, yeah. Another thing too that's worked out, like with the Federation of County Fairs, our meeting. I live in eight hour meetings. We're in Minneapolis. You drive four hours for a two or three hour meeting and then drive home again. And we've strictly went Zoom ever since uh, probably started in February or March. And it, it's it's worked out very well. We are able to have more shorter meetings rather than, than longer meetings, and it's it's uh, it's really worked out well. Everybody's been very happy with it, and I think we've saved uh, many thousands of dollars in mileage too. Hey Corey, is it all right if I ask a question unrelated? Yeah, absolutely. All right, this is Peggy with the South Dakota State Fair, and Michael, if you get it figured out, feel free to. To cut me off so two questions for all of you we um have a position change in our office with a new vendor coordinator position um and so through this process um we have kind of dove in a little bit to the database that we've been using which is access so my first question is um what database do you all use um as it relates to working with your vendors and concessionaires. Um, and then my second question would be, are you all, um, is there any language out there already developed as it relates to contracting with entertainers now? Um, you know, I know obviously force majeure, I'm not sure that that's gonna work anymore being we already know we're in a pandemic. I'm just wondering as we're, We've made some offers now and we're just starting to to look into the language part to, you know, if we if we have to um, either cancel or if there's restrictions and we have to reduce attendance, which obviously then has an impact on our revenue. So two questions. Peggy, uh, not here. Can everybody hear me? Yep. So uh, Peggy, I told you and Candy I'd get back to you after I spoke with our buyers. I apologize, I didn't. I've got some language that I'm very comfortable with that still uh, strongly enforces the use of force majeure in a paragraph. And then there's also some language that says if we are uh, mandated by local, state, or federal government to where we have a capacity of restrictions, that we have the opportunity to go back and renegotiate the deal points and the money based on uh, if there is a still a show, but it's at a reduced capacity. So we're pretty comfortable with that, the way that they've written that language. And uh, uh, two of the family members with Romeo are attorneys and they're 
obviously part of the business. So I'll send you what that language looks like, but um, I've heard of people saying that there's uh, stuff in contracts saying that if a entertainer doesn't feel safe or they think that uh, certain things aren't being followed, they can just cancel and get paid. But our contracts don't say that. I'll send a copy of that language to you. That'd be great. Thanks, Scott. One of the acts that we had booked for this year um, already had really good language about canceling, including a pandemic. Uh, it did not include any uh, language about reduced crowds or anything like that. Uh, um, but that was one of our grounds acts. So I, we're just working on some contracts now, and I think we're going to try and uh, and use some of that language in our contracts going forward. But it was, it was a force majeure plus listed, you know, everything from war to, to pandemics. Um, pandemics itself were listed in the contract. Tim, have you guys changed a bunch of language within your contracts? I know we, we've we put a COVID clause in ours, but it's, I, don't, I mean, it's just a little verbiage that tries to protect, I guess, the business from from spread and that kind of stuff. Oh, you're muted, Tim. Hold on a second here. Let me see if I can pull a mute off of you. You got me now? You got you. Um, we actually had language in our contract prior to this. We had been using the term epidemic as opposed to pandemic for whatever reason. So we changed it because everybody is using pandemic. We changed that wording. Right. Uh, but basically the same that if in fact there was a cancellation no one was liable there was no penalty for you know if it was canceled because of the pandemic right. however that developed because of the pandemic because of covid there was no penalty for the buyer no penalty for the artist uh and then what we tried in every instance there was a cancellation if we could is to reschedule for the following year uh, and like, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, some folks heard me say quite a few fairs have done that and a few others are are still hoping to reschedule. So that's that's what we where we're at with most of them. So are any of you kind of doubling down on your on your entertainment? OK, I'll shut up and we can have this conversation later. Great job. <laughs> Okay, looks like we got a PowerPoint up there. Tara, can you hear me all right? Yeah, give me a second. I'm turning on the slides. All right, good stuff. While we're waiting, um, and eventually we will get there, um, Again, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Congratulations on combining your efforts there with the two um, states. And um, it's pretty exciting that um, you're working through all the resources you possibly can. So, Terry, you're ready to go then, right? <laughs> Let's see if we can get a, get a response from Tara so I know she's ready. Okay, we're gonna give this a shot. I, I'm not sure if, um, oh, it looks like Tara's um, trying again here, so. I, as you were discussing all of your um, legal ease, force majeure um, discussions there, I might share with you that um, Live Nation isn't having as much luck as you are in terms of where you're at. Um, Live Nation is the largest entertainment company in the world, and they're, they still have a team of about 20 attorneys that still haven't concluded on what they're going to use for language. So you're not alone. This, uh, this new COVID element is uh, 
is uh, going to turn us upside down and sideways before we get straightened out a little bit here. Okay. All right. Looks like we're ready. So, Kara or Tara, if you can hear me, um, we're going to jump right in. We don't have much time compared to what's in the content here. Well, the COVID-19 reality, um, you know, we're in this for a while. I might share with you the pandemic of 18 lasted two and a half years. It was um, it was a pretty serious pandemic. Uh, there's um, although the records aren't extremely good, there is indicators that nearly 10 million people in the world were affected by the um, by the pandemic, and uh, almost five million actually perished. Um, so it looks like we're in a similar pattern. Next slide. Let's see, I don't know if Tara can hear me. There we go. So if you can see, there's some similarities. To begin with, the pandemic in 1918 started in March. Imagine that. That's kind of where we were when uh, Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo announced that they were going to have to shut down March 11. Um, there was an upswing, a significant upswing in the number of deaths in the fall of 1918. Um, the the uh, disease itself was actually spread not by um, the traditional sense, but since we're in the middle of World War I, the soldiers that were fighting overseas in a variety of countries and returning home on a regular basis actually spread the disease significantly. It's called the Spanish flu because Spain at the time was um, not in the war. And um, so they the uh, control elements within Spain were a little better actually than they were in the rest of the world. Um, and somehow the word Spanish flu came to, to light. It did not conclude until the summer of 1920. And as you can see, there are similar kinds of things that took place then that are taking place now, like wearing masks, closing of schools, theaters, concert venues, those kinds of things. So it's not a whole lot different uh, when you look at the basics uh, than what we're experiencing right now. Next slide. Everyone believes, uh, at least in some parts of the country, that it's political. And um, but there's no doubt about it. There's some politics involved. But it is a, it is a real disease. It's really happening. And um, we'll get our arms around it as a, as a country at some point. Next. So what are the realities that fairs must face? Well, first of all, there's going to be a lot of new rules. Um, and some of those rules um, are ones that we're going to have to create ourselves. Um, you know, if we wait for the officials to create the rules, we're not going to like them very much. Um, so we need to be engaged in the process right away. And uh, what I keep hearing from um, the nation as a whole on all the, all the players within our industry and those that are, support the industry is that we don't know what we don't know. So every day is different. Every day is a new story. Um, another another element comes in. Next is the money side. Uh, and I don't need to tell any of you what kind of um, struggle you're dealing with relative to the finances and the, the loss of these fares uh, having take, either not taking place or taking place on a very, very limited basis. And we'll continue to have to deal with money as we come along. Um, we're going to have to go through a reinvention and we're going to have to deal with innovation as we move through it. And we'll explain a little of that as we go through here. Um, we need to kind of rebrand ourselves for the opportunity of additional customers while going through this, yet keeping our loyalists um, within our ranks. Um, again, it's probably more important to make sure that we understand the fact that others are making decisions for us and we have to engage in the process locally, statewide and nationally and work as a group because we're, we're not very strong individually, but we are strong as a group. So, so through the IAFE and our other associations, that is the process by which we've got to get our messaging out. The other thing to recognize is that as we've now learned that cash as we know it in our society and in our finances is probably going away. There are already many businesses now that are not accepting cash or if they are, they have to be exact, uh, the exact amount of money. So you're going to see a cashless system 
and the point of sale system change dramatically on, across the nation as we get into the next couple of years. Next slide. So what about reinvention? Let's think about that for a moment. Does your organization fit the model for today's entertainment, facility management, and event management program? I think we have to ask that really hard question. Can you again withstand this pandemic? And there will be another one. We can't tell you when, we don't know how or what it will be, but there will be another pandemic. The history of civilization has pandemics regularly, or there'll be other crises that we have to deal like, as an example, 911. So how will we offer, operate in a post COVID world? We have to ask those questions too. And there, we often say in the business, in many businesses, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Because this is now the time for all fair organizations to reevaluate re their structure, their governance, their methodologies, the products and services they provide, and most importantly, their financial health. Next. So oftentimes in businesses, we create or we establish what we call performance audits. Much of the time, they're related to the business side of the page, meaning finances and how we operate as a specific business. But in this particular case, we're in a new world order and we need to consider many other things. So it's really time to step back and look at the entire organization, inside, outside, top to bottom. We should look at potentially looking at a third party, depending on what we're analyzing, particularly on the finance side. And you know, we got to consider all the sacred cows, everything we do, everything we present, everything we've been about, um, we've got to look at. We need to build our financial future and create a safe, safety net more than anything else. Multiple, multiple fairs have not had enough set aside funds to deal with where we're at today. Um, give you one example in California, the largest fair in California, the San Diego County Fair, you might have been reading about their situation lately, but they um, they were the third largest fair, or still are the third largest fair by attendance in the nation. Today, they sit at $22 million in the hole, and they are at 15% of their, of their staff. Uh, they're in massive layoffs. They're dealing with a, a pretty serious situation. That's one example in the business right now. More than anything else, I believe on an audit, we need to take an entrepreneurial spirit because we oftentimes let our emotions get involved, our traditions get involved, and now we need to look at this from an entrepreneurial point of view. Next. So this includes all the fair programs, our competitions, our exhibits, our events. We need to evaluate our non-fair elements. We got to meet with all of our stakeholders. Our facility and operations need to be audited and the way we operate those facilities. We need to look at technology. Obviously, we need to look at technology. That's a challenge, for, at least for me, that's a challenge. And it is for all of us, I believe. It's moving so fast and there's so much there that we really need to deal with that. We need to check our ego at the door because when we often go into board meetings or planning meetings, you know, we're all guilty of this at some level or another that our egos do get in the way. And if we need to, we need to look at it from an entire team perspective and move through the process. One consideration may be that our fair dates may not be the best fair dates. We also may want to consider the fact that um, maybe the entire fair should not happen during the four days, the five days, the 10 days. Perhaps it should be broken up into different times of the year or different days. So those are considerations that we all should look at in, in a full and complete performance audit. If we haven't done that already, and I'm sure many of you have done some of these, if not potentially all of these. Next slide. So one of our challenges um, that the fair industry faces, and it's true of agriculture, and that's where we came from, is that we're not a very good storyteller. And there are those out there that believe a different way than we do, that are extremely good at that job. They're so good at it that they, they're creating massive followings, electronic followings, uh, fan bases. Uh, one of those great storytellers, believe it or not, uh, is from the land of fruit and nuts here in California. 
and his, you might have heard of him. His name is Michael Pollan. He's a journalist at Cal State University at Berkeley. He's written several books on the food business, the food industry, and the, the readers are in the millions. And he's gaining more popularity as we speak. The other one, if you haven't seen this, uh, this documentary known as The Seed, this un The Untold Story, it is fascinating. I recommend highly you can see it on YouTube. I recommend highly that you view it. It's a beautiful, beautifully done um, story. It's about saving seeds and how we need to look at diversity of genetics in the world for all of our crops and, and plants. Um, but it's skewed towards the Michael Pollan point of view. So fairs have done a great job of, of showcasing, of creating competitions, of of doing what we do, as we have done them for many, many years. But we need to be a better storyteller um, because our message is not being understood by the same people that, that are following the Michael Polins and others that believe a different way. Next slide. Now, there is a person that many of you have probably heard, seen, read about, and that's talk, Dr. Temple Grandin. She covers many issues, but of course, her most um, her most dedicated effort is that of animal welfare. She it happens to be a great storyteller. And, and one of the reasons she's a great storyteller is she's brutally honest about what she does and what you do and what we all do if we're in the agricultural industry. There are a lot of issues that fairs can cover and be transparent about. And that is true that the, that the, the consumer demands transparency. In fact, 70, in recent studies, 73% of the nation wants transparency for within the agricultural realm. We've got a lot of issues. I'm not going to go through all of them. You've seen them. You know them. But the opportunity is there for change relative to showcasing, talking about those, presenting those, and educating and telling great stories about what we do and why we do it. Next. So we're... I mentioned money in the beginning, so these are just a few ideas that you might consider as you're doing your performance um, audits. Uh, you got to consider every possible revenue option, whether you've done them, you haven't done them, whether others do. We we have got to get really creative, and I've got a I've got a local operator here, and he says, Mike, if I can make five dollars, I can make anything work. And so that's a little theme that that he utilizes. He's a very large food vendor runs five restaurants and is at uh, 10 fairs across the nation, including the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo and the Denver Stock Show. Next. So one of those uh, elements that's come out of um, COVID is our ghost kitchens. Basically, these are what are being called cloud kitchens that prepare uh, food for delivery and pickup, meals only. It's not an in a seated space, indoor, outdoor. It's basically just a very professional commercial kitchen that must meet all the requirements of the local um, authorities. Um, the consideration would be how about either converting a professional kitchen on your grounds or adding, working with an operator to add a kitchen on the grounds where that operator invests in your, invests in your property. Um, and not only would they operate during the bulk of the year, but they'd also operate as a partner during the fair serving food. There are, believe it or not, even franchisee companies popping up at two or three locations across the nation. One is in the Miami area called the Local Culinary, and they'll basically show you from top to bottom how you can operate and be successful with a ghost kitchen. Next. So I call it Become a Hoarder. We've all seen storage units. In fact, most of us probably use storage units. Um, well, fairs were very, very good, particularly in the Midwest, at, at providing storage facility services for boats and RVs during the off-season. But we might want to consider year-round operations, including during the fair. Right now, the rise of the baby boomers is quickly um, accelerating, and they're downsizing. But they don't want to get rid of their stuff. We're all, we're all guilty of hoarding. We can't get rid of it. We, we, uh, we say we're going to leave it to our children, but they really don't want it, but we don't get rid of it anyway. So store, these storage facilities are gaining in, in uh, great momentum across the country and all communities. So why can't a fair, if they haven't done it already, why can't a fair invest in that option too? 
The other thing to look at is that these create good sponsorship opportunities for fairs. Um, and it's regular monthly income. Next. So the great digital migration, as it's now being called, is, is what was beginning to happen before COVID and what is happening in, a, in an accelerated way, um, pace now. And it's basically how we deal with pricing, products, services, purchasing, um, delivery systems, all those kinds of things. And those are all the analysis that we need to deal with relative to our performance audit. Um, understanding that the industry or the world, and particularly America, is moving fast to a cashless system. Next. So this may be a little bit uncomfortable. This may be a little bit unusual. This may be a little bit um, out of the ordinary, but what we have to do, and we're hearing this all the time, is we've got to embrace the fragmented portions of our communities, and they, they may not be the traditional fairgoer. They may be people coming into the community from other countries, from other states. Uh, they may be the new, new people on the block, as it were, new businesses that come in that support the process. But it's important that we look at that and, and, and look at it, it in a very positive way from an entrepreneurial standpoint. It creates growth opportunities. It creates sponsorship opportunities. Here are some examples of what the what what happens in the rest of the world in a very big way from a festival celebration and what we would call fairs and and something we might want to consider partnering with communities that may come into the community or do outreach beyond the community to add value to our fairs. Next. These are celebrations that take place in the country of Belize and Central America. Very, very big impact, very, very bright, rather colorful. Next. Th think about your gate and the, from the standpoint of maximizing impact. Certainly with COVID, we're going to have to deal with how folks come into our facility, how they safely come into our facility beyond just the security side but also relative to health standards that we may have to create and those protocols. But we don't have to allow the gate to become some neutral location, some uninviting location. We can come in with some elements and, and style that are not very, very expensive, but adds color. Um, it, it also maximizes opportunities for sponsors and others that might come in, and it celebrates what we are. Um, Understand that these kinds of things can be temporary or they can be permanent. Next. So this takes these kinds of activities with light um, and, and and what would be called lanterns that float basically with um, with a what would be a, considered a candle are very popular in Asia. Now here in California, we might get a little concerned about that because of our fire situation here in the West. And not that we don't have fires across the nation, we do, but this is something in a small way that you might consider from making a very personal activity that can celebrate your community, can celebrate what's best about your community and the people there. Next. So we um, we don't have too many camels in the country. There are some. This is a this takes place in India, but we do have a lot of horses. So if we can if we can reach back and do uh, you know celebrations re related to color and costuming and those kinds of things which took place probably a hundred years ago, that would be a, a great addition to our fairs from a showcasing standpoint. Next, another is something that takes place in Korea. Again, these are relatively easy to do that add color brightness and incredible inviting and um, elements um, at portions of your fairgrounds that you can do easily. Next. So the Day of the Dead, this is the most um, celebrated event in Latin American countries. It does take place um, the first two days of November traditionally, um, and it's not related to Halloween, by the way, even though it comes right after Halloween, but it it, it does create sponsorship, growth opportunities, 
elements of celebration within all of our fairs because the, the most growing sector of our population right now from a from a uh, the standpoint of nation state would be the Hispanic communities and they're growing at a fast and furious rate so why not envelop or or adopt and work with those communities to celebrate something that's that's really beautiful next slide the day of the dead um, also has dance it has food it has beauty it has art so those are things that you can work with and tie back into your fairs next so i think i promised that i do a top 10 list so these are what i'm considering change ideas for fairs and i might add um, a quote by t.s Eliot: only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go and understand that when you try something new and we've all done it probably um, our our peers may not agree with us and if we fail well that's that's failing if we succeed however then that peer is asking we asking how we did it and they're wanting to mimic that so give these a shot just as concepts and ideas take them back work with them um, they're just ideas they don't cost you anything next so the current food trends that are taking place in our nation they're they're um they're quite interesting first of all the nation is very very interested the populace and uh, granted most of this is on the west and the east coast but it isn't it is in the in the larger communities of the central part of the country as well the foods need to support immune systems they, they need to enhance our mood, basically because of what's going on with COVID. And what we're hearing very loudly is they need to reduce environmental impact, the way we grow them or deliver them. Consumers are purchasing 31% more items that are tailored to their health. 50% of consumers want to know what the benefits are of their food and their beverage. Flavor and color is becoming more and more important. There's clearly more cooking going on at home, and that is an opportunity for fairs. ADM, one of the giants in the food business, reports that consumer choices are driven by stress, anxiety, shifting priorities, and changes in social connectivity. Now, why is food so important? Well, in this COVID world, what we discovered about fairs that we knew already was there were two really, really important elements in our fairs. One was our 4-H and our FFA programs. The other was food. Uh, the food drives have been regular and consistent, um, and certainly they're one of our largest revenue generating programs at our fairs. So I'm providing you with some food trends that will allow you to look at things maybe a little bit differently in, in competitions as well as in, um, in your showcasing at the fair next. So kombucha. This is a brand new product that's uh, made uh, from fermented tea. It's got an effervescent flavor, flavor. It's low in alcohol, but it's got a big taste and it's coming on strong next. So I call it beyond corn oil. So the nation is looking at many, many different kinds of oil. Believe me, corn oil and canola are going to dominate, but there are many that are coming online right now that have been around, but are gaining greater popularity. And there are a wide variety of these. All the ones you can see on the screen there, including olive oil, which is um, gaining even greater popularity. Every one of these are providing very important health benefits from including lowering blood pressure all the way up to digestive benefits and allergy solutions. Next. So upcycled foods, trash to table is what we call it. Basically, this is taking food waste, not literally food waste, but food that is perfectly acceptable for consumption and utilizing it in a more efficient way. And there's more and more of this going on because what we're seeing in our in our nation is that um, we don't like food waste. Um, we we at the farm level have been providing, um, you know, secondary food items for many, many years to our food banks. But in this particular case, it's providing those kinds of foods for upscale and upcycled food items. Next. 
gut friendly foods. This is a great fair one because uh, this is all about preserving and canning. So um, what's taken place here is that those those food items, which are typically pickled, for lack of a better term, are very, very beneficial in our digestive system. Um, they're gut friendly, as they ca as they say. So, uh, uh, since they're on such a growth mode, it provides us uh, a little bit of a op different opportunity to showcase these a little differently. But we need to bring them out alone and make sure that we uh, provide extra media coverage, big awards, look at tasting opportunities for the public and get the message out in a different way than just listing them in our handbooks. Next. So mm. this is a little scary. We call it move over meat. So 50% of consumers are now eating these meatless products. And there are many of them. The most popular one tends to be this Beyond Burger, Beyond Meat product. But we're even coming out now with plant-based jerky of all things. Doesn't that sound tasty? There's a lot of vegan burgers and McDonald's is now coming out with what they call the McPlant in 2021, which is a meatless hamburger. So the number one food entity on the planet is coming out with a vegan based product. Now Tesco, which is a huge online food delivery um, retailer, is pushing sales that will increase, according to their accountants and analysts, 300% more sales in five years. And these plant-based meats already are more, are going to be on the dinner table during Thanksgiving and Christmas, more so than pork and beef for the first time this year. Now, that doesn't beat out turkey yet, but um, it is beating out pork and beef on the dinner table at the holiday. Next. So the, we've probably heard of the chickpea before. It's most commonly known as garbanzo beans and it's being used everywhere. So you can see the list of foods that it's going into and these are great opportunities for us to showcase those kinds of things. Next. Baby food, all grown up. So now um, Whole Foods, is working with a partner to create organic product that uh, comes in pouch for a, a child, a very, very young child infant that um, that uh, is basically in squeeze pouches and it's full of fruits and veggies. And um, it will inspire knockoffs, but this is something to consider from a uh, provisionary standpoint at fairs. Next. And don't worry, barbecue's still there. We're gonna have it for a while. We're going to enjoy it for a while. There are many competitions and they are growing. I will tell you that Tri-Tip is very famous here in California and the supply and delivery element in, across the nation is not meeting the demand. So we know beef is enjoyed. Uh, we know pork is enjoyed, lamb is enjoyed, and uh, barbecue is kind of the, the uh, key to that. So never fear, but we've got some other things coming behind it. Next. So cannabis, I didn't have a chance to look up where North Dakota, South Dakota is on the on the cannabis approval process, but states are um, by the tens or by the dozens right now are are um, legally accepting cannabis as a consumed good. Um, so, as you uh, if the Dakotas are not there yet, they will be. Um, I would promise that at some point or another, um, in some way, shape, or form, and there are many considerations for that. Uh, and how we deal with it from an educational standpoint, an enforcement standpoint, whether we're going to invite vendors to come in. And uh, these trade shows that take place, uh, these very large ones, by the way, are very professional, very well funded, and they, um, they're they very well, well done. Um, so they're not what you might think they are, um, much like we, um, we used to poo-poo um, tattoos shows. And some other, um, and even gun shows were uh, poo-pooed at one point, and they continue to be in some parts of the nation. But uh, this is coming your way. Next. So home improvement on a massive growth, particularly as COVID has hit us. Uh, it's a $38.1 billion industry. There are many, many um, television programs or uh, network programs as well as non-network programs. 33% of all of the dollars spent right now are going to the kitchen. 
Um, there's a lot of smart technology that's out there right now that are, is being utilized in remodels. Um, and, the, and the great news for fairs is they can showcase all this and modern, the modern farm look, as they call it, continues to be strong. So that ties back to fairs again. The other is that home offices and classroom in the home um, are creating options for home improvement too. Next. So dogs, I think all of us probably on the call have a pet or two or three. And, we, and we've either, if we don't own a dog, we probably have in our time. It's a big industry, folks. Uh, over a million jobs are created. It's a $221 billion economic impact. Um, in the Heartland states alone, it's $808 million in economic impact. And um, there's, there's just a lot of, of value for your fare relative to incorporating mm -hmm. dogs in some way, shape, or form um, with your events, your exhibits, your programming. Um, and and it is it is coming stronger because our culture is tending to make dogs a member of the family, and so they're um, and they they provide a real service to the elderly when they're alone, especially. And of course, their um, the the service dog industry is a big one and provides a lot of a lot of options too. Next. So we've heard of the light shows out there and we've seen them and perhaps your fairs have done some of those. I'm suggesting that perhaps we look at them in a bigger way on a year round basis and we basically convert our fairgrounds in totality into a light extravaganza. Now you might say, well, that could be quite expensive, which it could be depending on how you do it. But if we start out in a small way and grow, there may be some options there. Next slide. This is actually an ongoing exhibit here in Paso Robles. It's called Sensorio, and an artist um, was the one that created it. A local businessman had it on his pro or has it on his property, and it is literally a drive-through program with high-end food, high-end beverages, um, and creates. Uh, it runs from from basically when the sun sets all the way up to about eleven o'clock. Next. This is in South Korea. Again, more light festival elements. Next. So consider lights everywhere on your fairgrounds, potentially on an all year revenue based program with fireworks, with dancing water, with carnival, with de a date night theme, with group parties, um, you know, groups running in a whole light parade themselves and then every holiday. Next. So we know that children learn and adults learn by touching, by hearing, by smelling, by taste. And you live in corn country, and I'm sure you've tried some of these things or they're local to you. If the fairgrounds can create an environment like this where people can move in, feel, look, see, and learn something and enjoy it in the process all the better. Next. So the next generation of Blue Ribbon. So young people ages five to eight have historically not been part of the fair from a competition standpoint, um, but they are part of um, the largest junior livestock organization um, in the nation. That's the National Junior Swine Registry. The American Angus Association also has a younger group here. And ironically, they are the largest group of the membership and uh, continue to be a very, very strong growth area. So we need to we need to look at fairs and how they can wrap their arms around these young ladies and young men, and more importantly, how we wrap our arms around their parents and their grandparents who are willing to spend money so that these children have a great experience. And look at the options for when they come in as a young person, instead of coming in strictly on the competition level, that we create fun and inviting educational programs that they participate in, you provide unique recognition programs, and perhaps we don't emphasize the auction as much as we do their experience. Next. So this is a this is an industry on steroids, folks, and we've all seen our children and our grandchildren um, like the young man to the left there, haven't we? Um, this is literally an untapped market for fairs. Um, it's called eSports 
and these tournaments where you can you can be in Asia, you can be in in North Dakota, you can be in Florida, or you can be at the at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo, and you can participate in this virtual reality gaming activity. And it's it's on a on a huge growth curve. For the last five years, it's grown 19 percent each of the last five years. It's got an untapped market. And most of the money that is generated at venues that are utilizing these programs, 69%, in fact, comes from sponsorship and advertising. Next. So artificial intelligence. I'm not going to go through all of these, but consider this as you do your, your um, performance audit, as well as as you showcase or look at showcasing this kind of technology at fairs. Next. So the rest of the story, remember, we talked about being a storyteller. And we're going to go through these slides rather quickly, Tara, that what I want to be able to have us understand is that we've done a great job of telling the livestock story the, on the hoof. We've done a great job of showcasing fruits and vegetables in trays with blue ribbons. And we've done a nice job of showcasing the horse in competition and small animals in competition. What we and we've we serve a lot of food, don't we? What we haven't done is told the story of from basically from the farm to the grocery store. That's basically the, the area of the industry that is the largest and the area of the industry that the public has no idea about. They have, it's bad enough they don't understand what happens on the farm, but they clearly don't understand what happens in the middle. So this is an opportunity for fairs to showcase that and 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 do the storytelling in the greatest way. Let's run through those slides rather quick and I'll just highlight them as we do, Tara. So Moochine, got, let's call it edutainment. We get to milk cows, we get to see the technology and we get to see comedy and experience um, a science show that's tied to milk production. Next. So warehousing, it, there's, a, there's actually, as you can see, a lot of color, a lot of, um, a lot of te texture and smells and elements and educational opportunity where we house and and relocate our food. Next. So the, the, you're, li you're in the middle of the breadbasket of the world and um, it takes, as I say, a thousand villages. So there's huge stories to tell about the, t the industries that tie everything together to get that grain from the farm to the to the to the retailer. Next. Transportation, lots of players here too. How do we get it there? Next. Labeling, this is probably the most controversial category because now we're being restrict, food industry is being restricted and, and told exactly what must go on labels and how it's to be laid out, what size the type, the font is and everything. Next. Um, technology and special, specialization is, is just an unlimited story as we've talked about before. Next. The, the dirt, is it dirt or is it soil? It's dirt if it's on your pants, my professor once told me, and it's soil if we grow food in it. And there's a big story there, and it's very, very important, no matter if you're in, in South Dakota or you're in Washington State, and we've got we've to show why it's so important to preserve that, why and what it does. Next. So the untold story of the biggest grain on the planet, corn. It's in everything we do and everything we wear and everything we eat practically. So, but we haven't really told that middle story. Next. So co-ops, very critical in the Midwest. They're critical in the, in the West as well. They, again, big story here about marketing and branding and, and how we get product to the retailer next. Food product relocation, moving from state to state, community to community, and globally. Next. So you're you're again in the middle of the great meatpacking centers of the nation where, where you're at, but we don't, you know, all we hear is the negativity of how we're shutting plants down because of COVID. But we don't tell are the great people that work in those industries and how we package our meat, how we inspect our meat what the food safety programs are all about, what quality we bring to the table um, there. Next. 
So there's a lot of folks and a lot of things in the middle. And, you know, the list could go on and on here, but I encourage you to consider that in the storytelling at the fair next. In addition to tasting and testing, which in the kit in the commercial kitchens across the this nation that deal with foods coming into the system and then going out in a, in a safe way and in a flavorful way and a colorful way. Next. So finally, You've got beautiful sunflowers in both your states. I would I would encourage those to be planted everywhere on your grounds and during fair time that they bloom at their greatest blooming moment. Thank you for this opportunity. And if there's any questions, if there's time for questions, I'm happy to answer those. Yeah, I think we'll uh, open it up to uh, questions for a few minutes. Um, uh, before I even say thanks, Michael, um, if, if anyone has any questions, either type one out in the chat or or feel free to uh, ask away. Someone's got to have something. <laughs> well, before before uh, we get uh, on, hold go on. Ahead. Um, so I have the PowerPoint, Michael, are you okay with me sharing it if anybody wants to go through it or? Absolutely. Yeah, feel free. Well, you can think of some questions, but I do want to say thanks a bunch, Michael. That was great. Um, this is us giving you a great big virtual applause. Um, <laughs> normally we would all like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We don't want to unmute everyone and then we'll have this big conglomerate, but um, thanks a bunch to you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot to the IFE. Um, don't everybody take off. We do have two more showcases for tonight. So I'm going to give everyone another minute or two here if you've got a question. Otherwise, um, we will move along. But uh, thanks again, Michael. And uh, here's everyone's chance for a little Q&A with Michael Bradley. I'll hang out as long as, you, as you'd like me to. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I see you have a lot of ideas there and I. And we're looking forward to the other side, I think here in the Dakotas um, and we've been hit particularly hard if you haven't read the news, but. Um, is there something is, is there something some way we can set ourselves up for we're back? I mean, we're going to do things different. We learned some some things from our achievement days, but I mean, but how do we how do we tell our public we're back, and how do we tell our public we're still more relevant? I know they're starving for entertainment, but are are we still it? Well, the good news is that you you've got you've got a lot of loyalists, and you're not going to lose a high percent of those for sure. So as we as some of the mentors that I used to have used to say. Mike, if you just give them the date, 75% of the people will come to the fair. And I think there's some truth to that. The other thing to, to understand is that the last time we shut down fairs at, nationally was right during World War II. Now, not every fair shut down, but the majority shut down. The greatest surge in fairdom history in terms of attendance, and in many cases, the greatest records that haven't been broken yet, happened in 1946 and 1947. So people are pent up, they're ready, they want it to come back, they desire it coming back. Now, when it does come back, we need to be ready. That's why I strongly suggest, strongly suggest those performance audits. We have to ask ourselves the hard questions, like you're asking now, Bradley, about what, uh, you know, how do we tell them? What do we tell them? You know what? One of the things I've learned over time is ask them, what do they want? You know, um, it's OK that we may not agree, but we have to ask our people what they need, what they want, what do they want to see, what what's missing. Now, they may be very happy, and I think what you'll find is that most people will tell you they're very happy. Um, but it's that two or three voices out there that send a different kind of message. Um, and we have to study the people coming into your states, the people um, that are new and more than anything else, we need to listen to people under the age of 35 because that's the greatest number of folks in our country right now. And they will determine the future. 
when you know we, we may still be here when they're when they're leading what we're doing we may not but we need to start to change and look to what they want and how they want it more so than we do the majority of the folks that are in leadership right now so that's the group to ask and 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 i would tell you also that um women are the influencers of all of the consumption in this country. Women consume 95% of all consumable goods in the United States. They, um, they also make 75% of all the entertainment decisions in the United States. And they control 40% of the stocks and bonds in the United States. And most of those are widows. Now, hopefully that gives you some idea there, but I, I think that you, you have to try new things. You have to be a little risky, but you have to plan accordingly and not break the bank. You know, we've got to, we got to come back so that we can put money back in the bank and back in our facilities. And we have to ask the community, ask the community two things. One, what do you want and will you help us get there? Because I believe that people will give to fairs that will support fairs, businesses, individuals, companies, they'll they'll give back if we ask. But we haven't been very good about that, frankly. We've, we've just kind of gone along. And we've done well. We've done well at it. But now we're learning through this horrific pandemic where reality is. I don't know if that gave you the answer you wanted. <laughs> Anyone else got something for Michael? Well, I appreciate it, Michael. After uh, we got through a couple technical difficulties, I think it was still wonderful. Um, and, and again, I think it's something that we've all grown accustomed to as we're we're all adjusting to the technology needs and advancements that um, kind of got thrust on to all of our laps. So um, thanks for uh, thanks for dealing with that. Now we're all in the fair world too. So we're used to things not going exactly according to plan, uh, especially in the entertainment world, the fair world, it's, uh, it's all the same. So we just pick up the pieces and keep keep rolling along. So so thanks for giving it your your all. Um, Thanks again, Michael, and we'll get that presentation shared. Um, but at this time, we're going to roll on to a, a couple of showcases. We've got um, Creative Community Promotion <coughs> is, um, is going to present Mike Walker and Friends. Uh, Mike Walker and Friends proves that there's nothing more entertainment than a gifted impressionalist, an incredibly talented mimic. Walker brings his repertoire on of more than 50 celebrities to one stage. He also expertly performs his own music in this incredibly entertaining show. Close your eyes and get lost as one famous singer after another takes over Mike's voice. If you enjoy songs from a variety of singers, don't miss Mike Walker and Friends. You'll get all your favorite artists and one seasonal sensational performer. Mike Walker comes to us through Creative Community Promotions. Contact Joel for booking. Tara, can you hit the video? Mike Walker will leave a lasting impression on you. I've been really trying, baby. Trying to back these feelings for so long. I got a woman. So me, son, always be a good boy. Don't you ever play with guns? Yeah, we're two of a kind, working on the full house. Master impressionist Mike Walker will prove his prowess, and no celebrity is safe. I know I made you cry, but baby, if I could turn my child, you baby, this girl will take my mind. Nashville recording artist and master impressionist Mike Walker. Honey, do you, you want to live all night? Honey, do you, you want to hold me tight? 
partnership and uh, creative community promotions in Joel. So if you want more information or want to see if Mike is available for your fair, um, we've got one left and that's Darianne Lay. Um, Nashville recording artist Darianne Lay hails from Carlstad, Minnesota. Her debut single, Give Me One Minute of Your Time, charted number one on the She Wolf Network and number one on Nashville's independent artist radio station, uh, the Black Sheep Network. She has opened for Jake McPhee and Kat Perkins, was featured on PBS Studios in Fargo, North Dakota, performed the Vegas Valley Winery in Las Vegas and numerous fairs and festivals. She comes with a full band ready for a grandstand shows or free stage entertainment. Contact Brian Carlson of Carlson Talent Agency listed on the membership pages on the website. Tara, can you please hit Darianne? Oh, hey, D. Hey. So how are you doing? Why do you deal with her? What do you mean? You could do so much better. <laughs> you don't know me very well. Brandon, we used to be best friends. Things are different now. Things have changed. They don't have to be. What do you mean? Give me a minute of your time. I can't. Tomorrow. There you are. Come on, I gotta go show you something. Hey, Cannons ready to run. We don't know what you've done. You're a fighter who's looking for someone to hold you when you're down. You're a runner who's looking for a reason to stay in this town. Give me a minute. Thank you. 
in the star for the northern star it gives you let me be your light it guides you All right, another uh, big virtual round of applause for uh, Darian Lay uh, with the Brian Carlson Talent Agency. If you um, have any questions, uh, get a hold of Brian Carlson at the Carlson Talent Agency. I want to again remind everyone for our annual meeting that will be at 12 p.m. Central Time tomorrow. Uh, you've also link for another Teams meeting. Um, I want to say thanks to each and every one of you uh, for taking the time out of your evening tonight uh, to attend Michael Bradley's uh, keynote speaker. Thank you very much, Michael. And thanks to GL Berg Creative Community Promotions and Brian Carlson for all um, providing some showcasing entertainment for us tonight. And again, don't forget to tune in tomorrow, 12 p.m. Central, for our annual meeting. We've got some very important bylaw. Um, edits. Uh, we've got some elections that had to take place. So um, all of you go out, enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, can't wait to see you all tomorrow at 12 p.m. So thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks, Tara, for doing a great job and aligning this tonight. And thanks, Corey, for hosting. I'm not trying to steal any MC's job. They can all have it back. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. You're, def you're, you're definitely no Freddy, Corey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good night, everyone. Bye, Robert. Uh, uh.